Welcome to Masters of Product Management, powered by Sequent Learning Networks, a show that provides extraordinary insights for product managers who want to go faster and farther in their product management careers. Hello, this is JJ Rory, Vice President at Sequent Learning Networks. In our Masters of Product Management podcast, we tap into the experiences of people who work in and around product management to help you learn and grow in your product management career. Today's topic, scope creep. Every product manager and engineer's favorite thing. Scope creep is, of course, when after we finalize the scope for a project or release, the requirements for that release magically somehow keep increasing. Whether it's an idea for a new feature, updated customer feedback on how something should work, or just more requirements, the scope of our development work can sometimes feel quite fluid and is something that must be acutely managed. While some of this new feedback can actually be valuable, it does make it difficult to score if the goal line is constantly changing. I'm excited about this topic today, and our guest is here with some great advice on managing scope creep. An entrepreneur since his early 20s and now owner of Agency Labs, a full-stack technology studio, Jonathan Soares and his team of talented technologists have delivered more than 600 projects in collaboration with some of the world's leading in-house and traditional agency teams to build software with complete peace of mind. Their portfolio includes work for hundreds of global brands, including IBM, Nestle, Ford, eBay, Sotheby's, and many more. Jonathan, thank you so much for joining me today. JJ, I'm happy to be here. Thanks so much for having me. You bet. So we've all had to deal with scope creep. Can you share your thoughts on why this is so common in product development? Absolutely. I think um, the most common reason is because everyone is um, taking so much pride in, in what they're building, either on the production management side or if you want to call it the client side. There's a vested interest to you know create something wonderful um, and also make um, both sides of the table very happy. Uh, typically, you know, when I'm uh, asking about, you know, how we're dealing with scope creep and, you know, you know, some of the reasons why it is so common, I typically break it down into, into two sides of the house. You've got your production side issues and your client side issues. Uh, oftentimes, if we're, you know, we're talking about project or product managers, um, it's always like, oh, you know, what am I doing wrong? But oftentimes, you know, it's what, what the client is doing wrong too. Um, so typically on the production side, you know, you have poor documentation, um, lack of communication, and then deviating from process. Uh, and on the client side, you have uh, a client knowledge gap. Uh, they might be in a new role, may not necessarily know exactly how they're building or uh, what needs to be built or some of the you know, specific requirements that go into it. So there's just the unknowns. Um, it could also be client ego, uh, which we all know that happens uh, no matter what. You know, it's whatever that individual says goes and it's a tough personality to manage. Uh, or it could also be an internal decision maker. You think you're working with the deciding party, but there's another chain of command above and beyond that is also providing feedback and kind of uh, going about the process in their own manner. So those typically tend to be the, the delineation between both sides and what typically makes scope creep so common in a bunch of different uh project engagements. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, and, you know, it's interesting, you, you, you talk about clients and, and how, you know, how their mindset, if you will, um, same thing goes with complete internal teams, right? Internal cross-functional teams, the cl- there's always a client, right? Sometimes I, I like to talk to, to product managers about that and, you know, product managers being the client of engineering or sometimes even vice versa. Um, so great advice in terms of, uh, uh, you know, how these cross-functional teams, internal, external, or a combination um, kind of work together. I love what you said about taking pride. Um, that's one of the things that scope creep has a, has a, a very negative connotation for, for obvious reasons. Um, but the truth is the intention uh, behind these, these issues that, that lead to scope creep is typically let's make a better product. Uh, but it's our job to make sure that we, we actually hold the integrity of that. So, so speaking of that, I, I often tell product managers the worst thing they can do is say yes to everything. It just, you'll never get anything done that way. But second worst is probably to say no to everything, right? Because sometimes really good ideas do come in after the fact and frankly should be added to a release or at least considered. What tips do you have for product managers to 
keep the scope integrity while still not turning a blind eye to these valuable additions? This question really hits home uh, for me. Uh, so we've been in business for eight years. And um, the first a few years of the business as we were establishing, establishing ourselves, um, wanting to obviously make all of our clients happy. We were, uh, yes, men and women. Um, and it got to the point where we saw the ripple effect, domino effect of constantly saying yes. Um, and then there was a, a short period where it was like, all right, we've got to stop this. And we started saying, no, 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 no. Um, this phase of the business as we were you know, learning and growing early on made us realize the importance of empathy and, and having a broader understanding uh, of the client, the requirements, and what to say yes to and what to say no to. Uh, in our world, um, oftentimes development firms, uh, they're saying no to everything. Here's a scope. This is what you agree to. End of story. And that becomes challenging, especially for some of the agencies, be it in-house or traditional agencies that we're working with, because they in turn have a client to report to that they're, that's very important to their business. So ha- not having any flexibility at all uh, becomes detrimental overall to the relationship uh, because oftentimes certain things come up. Um, so typically uh, the, the, the tips uh, um, that, I would per- that I would give to anyone who's kind of trying to figure out, you know, what's the right balance, um, definitely keep track of timeline and scope. Um, have your Gantt chart, have your um, production workflows lined up, you know, your resources accounted for. Um, all of the features and functionality, the overall like requirements that you put together, have that all in the document that's you know accessible to not only your team but also uh, the other stakeholders on the quote unquote client side, so they can visualize how things are progressing. Transparency is super super important. Um, in addition, track as much production time as you can. I know it depends on you know uh, the resources that are involved. Sometimes designers don't like tracking time. Developers, you know, track time on everything, you know, who does, who doesn't across the board. Organizations really should have a kind of global mandate of saying, hey, on these projects, we need everyone to track time because that um, gives the product you know, manager uh, or project manager the ability to, to make decisions. If you are ahead of schedule and the project is turning out to be more profitable than you initially anticipated, there's some wiggle room to add certain pieces of functionality and that data, that insight is extremely um, impactful for an individual to make those decisions as they're kind of talking to um, an individual on their side. Um, Document each request. I I tell my team to have a spreadsheet and label if something is in scope or out of scope. And going back to, you know, my uh, answer to the first question on poor documentation, documenting everything in a very detailed proposal or scope of work even if this is like an in-house project, have your own scope of work that you draft so everyone knows what this deliverable is going to entail. Document against that and make sure that whoever is making decisions on the other side of the table, they understand what is in scope and out of scope. And if you have a document that, uh, I guess, dictates as a benchmark of what is or it isn't, it's a much easier conversation. If your um, documentation is purposely vague, um, that generally works against you because then it's, you know, finger pointing and, you know, whose responsibility is it and, and should or shouldn't it be, be included. Um, from there, uh, communicate the scope items, um, any implications, you know, timeline implications, functional impl- implications. Sometimes a you know, client wants a feature, but that might impact two or three other features or how something was built or architected if you're building out a piece of software uh, and also figure out priority. Um, certain things are nice to have. Uh, we often get brain farts or ideas in the middle of the night and we jump off and say, oh, this would be amazing. But that's not necessarily um, an important feature for a phase one release. It could be a phase two or a phase three. So as- associating priorities is super, super important. Um, and then also to listen. Uh, a lot of people are quick to you know make a judgment where they should really be listening and gathering requirements because oftentimes um, clients are looking for our expertise and our feedback, they might want X piece of functionality, but in reality, there might be an alternate recommendation that could be uh, a quick fix uh, and be included in the scope and not require a massive budget increase or scope increase. So having those conversations and being open to that to make recommendations is important. So whatever the client is, is suggesting or requesting, take the time to listen. Don't be apprehensive about them making a, re- a request. Uh, And then from there, you know, make the decision collectively uh, to see what's going to be in the best interest of the overall product and project timeline. Okay. So building on this, how do you deal with a scope 
pickle. <laughs> I say, no, no, we can't do this. You say, yes, we have to do this. Okay, so where do we go from there? So scope pickle is always fun. Um, th- this tends to get deeper into how important the relationship is um, and, and what your relationship is with that person. Uh, oftentimes, you know, someone has to take a hard line. It could be the client saying, look, if you don't include this, this is going to ruin our product and, you know, we're going to have to go elsewhere. Um, certain product managers, you know, comfortable calling a bluff and say, all right, fine. Well, you know, this is, you know, going to impact the project. And I don't feel comfortable with that. Uh, at certain times, there's some, some give and take. So understand the other party, understand the importance of the relationship. If it's going to be monumental to lose an account over, you know, a thousand dollar scope edition. I mean, if it's a hundred thousand dollar scope edition, that's a much different conversation, but understanding these variables and making a call based on the bigger picture, um, it, you might have to acquiesce in certain points. And also to going back to like documenting, if you're going to give a few, um, you got to take a few. So uh, making sure those communications are open so that if you do get to a pickle, you can say, Hey, John, Hey, Sally, you know, these three things I've already kind of acquiesced to, um, this one, I mean, it's, you know, we're really pushing it. This just isn't going to work. Um, and then if that happens, I would at that point probably escalate it, um, because there might be a, a larger situation at bay that you want to really, um, nip in the bud and try to figure out early on if possible. Yeah. I like that advice. Uh, you, you know, at the end of the day, it all comes down to the value, right? What's the, the value to the end user, to the end client? Um, and if we can prove that something additional would add value, um, even if we have to take some scope out that those, some of that nice to have we originally had in scope, um, you know, let's make sure that that value stays intact. So great advice. Thank you. And those scope pickles are always fun. Funny, and yeah. I like the term too. <laughs> well, that's funny about that is typically like the scope pickles that we, we've seen happen. It's always a CEO or C level that comes in and wants something like, oh, you know, so and so wants this with no understanding of ramifications. And it puts that person you're kind of either reporting to in an awkward position. So it ends up actually being multiple pickles. Um, <laughs> and it put, a bowl of pickles. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's a whole lot of pickles sometimes. So you have to really be careful and understand like what's driving some of those conversations. I mean, for me, Oftentimes I'll be on a call and I'll say, let me guess, it's so-and-so wanting this. And they're like, yeah. And then you understand the position they're in. Either you can empower that person to try and go back and come up with an alternate approach, or you might want to be looped into that conversation to try and describe why certain things may or may not be done. And getting to the source is even more effective. And, but that comes through, you know, conversing and figuring out, you know, what's, what's the driving factor. Yeah, definitely. Great advice. So, so what are some of the best practices that you found in managing scope creep? It, it all starts around empathy, um, putting yourself in the client's shoes, um, taking time to talk, have conversations. Um, don't be so quick to, to judge or to say no, like we mentioned earlier. Um, and then also to oftentimes a product or a project manager, um, they could be a type A personality because they have to be. And it's either black or white, but being able to uh, decompartmentalize situations and be comfortable in gray uh, is really important because oftentimes in the gray area where things can seem chaotic, um, once you navigate through, um, you can really get to some uh, resolutions pretty quickly, but you have to be comfortable in that area. Um, And that's a a really important uh, place to be if you're in those types of situations. Great. Any final advice for product managers, developers, engineers, anyone um, involved in in projects and releases on controlling scope creep? It's the same advice I give to to my team. Own your role. Um, Clients are paying us. They're paying you um, to manage a project. So project manage. Um, That's what you're here for. Um, If that ends up being really problematic, um, if you've taken into account all the advice that we've given throughout, you know, this podcast, you know, there's a you know, bigger situation at play, but don't be afraid to, to, to own your role. Oftentimes people uh, or individuals really get uh, concerned or worried because it could be their job on the line. At the end of the day, be confident, support, you know, your decision um, with facts and data. And uh, I think you'll be in, uh, in, in really good shape. Yeah, that's great advice. Own your role. I'm going to get that on a t-shirt. <laughs> 
Maybe I'll put a put a pickle on the t-shirt as well. <laughs> <laughs> so this has been a fun but very important discussion. Scope creep is something we all deal with. And thank you so much, Jonathan Soar, CEO of Agency Labs, for sharing some great insights into managing this ever-present reality. Jonathan, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you, JJ. It really is always a pleasure. And thank you for joining us on Masters of Product Management, powered by Sequent Learning Networks. I am JJ Rory, and I look forward to speaking with you on the next episode. You've been listening to Masters of Product Management, powered by Sequent Learning Networks. If you'd like to take your career to the next level with additional tools, training, coaching, and books, be sure to visit Sequent Learning Networks at sequentlearning.com. <laughs>